is going to be the LaRouche Four Laws. We have to define the national mission of the presidency and what its policy must be. Now, if you've been following what we've been doing or have been following the news, you know that there have been some very dramatic changes in the political uh, situation was delivered on what we said we would do to the FBI. Uh, we have not fully delivered, but we have, in fact, created a situation where, in fact, we are about to see an investigation of the investigators. This is not merely something we're saying. It's being echoed by various press from the Wall Street Journal, even the Washington Post. The New York Times is still not saying too much, but they're not going to be able to resist uh, the wave of the present. Uh, there are many uh, different elements to this, and rather than go any of them, because that would actually divert from the primary reason we're on tonight, I want to just say a couple things uh, before we start with our speaker. Uh, so we have two pamphlets, uh, the Mueller pamphlet uh, and the America uh, Must Join the New Silk Road pamphlet, which should be out by next week. So we're actually going to have the two main weapons we need in our arsenal. We are not planning to take Christmas off. We can't because we have a present much to deliver to the American people. That is uh, a reversal of the coup against the president. So this is what Lena LaRouche built this organization to do in part. The second part, and that's what we want to really focus on, uh, as I think people know, or many people at least know, uh, Keisha Rogers uh, last week announced that she would be running uh, uh, for Congress as an independent in Texas uh, against Congressman Al Green. Uh, and there is much to be said. I'll let her go ahead and say whatever she wants. But the importance of that is not the uh, Texas race. The importance is that the United States is seeing a certain kind of vacuum that we need to fill. That is that the president may clear his Russia policy and China policy, but then the question is, how do you actually define how those policies become activated in America? And that our movement is, has to take the responsibility for, we have to be the leaders and we have to personify that. And so in order to start that process uh, and to define that process, uh, we've got Keisha on the phone tonight, and she will now take over and tell you exactly what her intent is and what we hope yours will be as well. So, Keisha, are you there? I am. Good evening. Okay, so let me just start with this. Thank you all for being on tonight, and uh, I'll just start by by making clear for many people who have already heard and those who may be new on the line who haven't heard or may not be familiar with my campaigns, uh, I have just recently, as Dennis State, filed a statement of intent here in Texas to run as an independent for the U.S. House of Representatives in Congressional District 9, in the 9th Congressional District of Texas, and that is the seat that current Congress member Al Green holds. Now, I'm going to be petitioning for a position on the November 2018 ballot as an independent following the March primary elections here in Texas. So now I, I wanted to start just with that from the standpoint that to give you, first of all, a little bit of background about my qualifications, my work with Mr. LaRouche over the past now nearly 15 years that, that I have run congressional campaigns going back to 2010, where I ran my first campaign in 2010 and secured the Democratic Party nomination, and also again in 2012, securing the Democratic Party nomination, uh, fighting, leading the charge and calling out front uh, to end the and destruction of policy, destructive policies against our nation by President Obama, calling for Obama's impeachment during those periods, particularly for his continued criminal actions against our country, including his commitment to war policy, regime change, his Tuesday kill list, and most emphatically, which we'll get into uh, more, the destruction of our national space program with the brutal cuts 
to the constellation program and destruction of our moon return program that was set into motion by the constellation. So, but what we saw during the Obama administration was an outright commitment to defending the interest of Wall Street. And this is what my campaign and many of my colleagues on the national slate that I ran as LaRouche candidates on the national slate acted immediately to reject this policy of Wall Street booting of our national economy and to call for the down of Wall Street and restoring of glass banking reorganization. And so it's important to understand that history right now because if you this is what actually garnered a great success with my campaigns here in Texas, despite the fact that there was a real backlash from the national and local Democratic Party at all costs. As I said, um, the victory came about when people in not only in the district, in the state, supported my campaign calling for a return to a national mission, a visionary perspective as outlined by President John F. Kennedy and also President Franklin Roosevelt, and which has been the commitment of Lyndon LaRouche and his economic policies for many decades now. And many people responded to that call of leadership and recognized that we campaign actually offered solutions. And this is what is absolutely required today. What I'm hoping to see is that more people, many, maybe even some of you on the conference line here, will take it upon yourselves to, to actually launch into this fight to run political campaigns yourself. What we need right now is we need a swarm of leadership emerging throughout the country of people all over the nation. And this is not a matter of party politics. This is a matter of who will commit to a restoring of a national mission for the country. And I think it's clear, it, it's very important right now to recognize that we're not talking about what's going to be needed for almost a year from now in a November election, but what is required immediately and what must be implemented at this present time to save our nation, to save the U.S. economy, to turn around the uh, decades-long physical economic collapse that we've seen in the country. And we're at a very unique opportunity to be able to do that. It's going to require the educational process of the American people. It's going to require a number of you and others stepping up to the plate to provide the leadership that's needed. And I think it, it really is going to require a new commitment and understanding of what the idea of a national mission really should constitute. And Mr. LaRouche, uh, who I've worked with and Dennis has worked with, but I can say for myself, I've worked with Mr. LaRouche for about 15 years now. Many of you on this phone may have known of Mr. LaRouche for many decades longer than I have or even that alive. But I can say that what has defined the success of what I've been able to provide in terms of the quality of leadership in taking on this fight for a restored national mission in the sense of what we had under the leadership and the vision of President John F. Kennedy, where the commitment to the space program, as my campaign was a very strong proponent of, was not just for the space program itself, but for what Kennedy did in actually mobilizing the U.S. recovery program. This is the motto, the mobilization of my campaigns, and has been the direct influence of the work that Lyndon LaRouche has been involved in for many, many years now. We have a national mission orientation and a science driver crash program 
for restoring the productivity of our nation. So that I think that that is the que that is the fight at hand right now. That as we look at the rapid shift toward development in the world at the present time, you see what's happening in terms of a commitment by nations that are joining with China in the Belt and Road Initiative. That the direction for a national mission for our country isn't just for the benefit of the United States itself, but the world is moving right now toward a unified global paradigm, which is a paradigm shaped around the idea that the an international commitment to collaboration, to ending poverty, to ending the threat of war, to ending hunger, to ending in the United States and uh, elsewhere, the rapid increase of drug abuse and the collapse of physical infrastructure. I mean, this has to be our commitment, not just as to our own nation, but to that in collaborations around the world. And the best way to define and to actually secure the victory of accomplishing those goals is through a commitment to a national driver, which is our commitment to reviving our national space program. And so uh, that's what's been my number one priority is uh, continue to campaign even off campaign seasons and continue to be very present in the space community and the scientific community. This is what we have a, a very important obligation to see through. And I think if people hadn't see to hear the president on this um, this past week, he made he made an intention to that very idea. And what I want to go through is I, I want to just give you a sense of what the president has done in terms of uh, now putting a next step toward what he committed to doing back in March when he first developed, uh, back in March when he first uh, signed the National Authorization Act and then following that called for a recommitment and also a actually called for creating a national space council which was has been now led up by the vice president of the United States PIN with a, a council of people in the scientific and space community and after the first meeting of that space council back in October the president uh, requested that the council put together request and a direction for what policies must be put through in terms of a, a space mission orientation. And uh, objective has been to make sure that we reverse the policies for of the past eight years uh, plus of. Uh, taking down our commitment for a return to a moon Mars mission orientation to uh, after now on the anniversary of the last mission, last human mission to moon, which was the Apollo 17 uh, back in 1972, that now we are going to commit ourselves again to that restored mission to uh, taking human beings back to the moon and having a permanent presence on the moon and then on to Mars. But just to put, put it right in his words, this is what the president had to say. The directive I am signing today will refocus America's space program on human exploration and discovery, said President Trump. It marks a first step in returning American astronauts to the moon for the first time since 1972 for long-term exploration. This time, we will not only plant our and leave our footprints, but we, excuse me, we will not only plant our flags and leave our footprints, 
we will establish a foundation for an eventual mission to Mars and perhaps someday to many other worlds. And so, but it's important to understand that this is this obligation is only going to be met under one condition and that condition is that we have to remove all limitations of a monetarist form of thinking of balancing the budget budget cuts tax cuts none of this is going to actually or the needed vision for restoring optimism and a commitment national fulfilling that mission and I think it's very important right now that while we have the enemy running scared where the whole coup plot operation to destroy this presidency and potential good is there right now um, where the president of the United States who over the course of the last several that he's been president has made a stated commitment to the idea of an American system economic policy referencing the ideas of President Abraham Lincoln of the great economist of uh, of President John Quincy Adams of Alexander Hamilton the first Treasury Secretary of the United States now we have to ensure that these are not just words, that this commitment is fulfilled. And we have to bring together those patriotic forces in the population who can quickly adopt to the immediate solutions that have been put forth by Lyndon LaRouche and to demand that these policies become law immediately. And we know what they are. As uh, many of you know, right now we're in, we have put out on no, numerous occasions the four laws, four economic laws to save the U.S. economy that has been instituted, constituted by Mr. LaRouche, uh, starting with a Glass-Steagall banking reorganization policy, a commitment to a national return to a Hamiltonian national bank, a national credit program, and a science driver mission orientation with a crash science fusion program. And that, the you really have to look at all those four laws from a top-down perspective. If you want to get an understanding of you know, what a national mission constitutes. And I mean, it's you really have to think about it, that I'm, I'm under 45 years old myself, and um, I'm just turned 41. And most of my generation, pretty much all of my generation, never actually lived through this idea of what constitutes a true national mission for the country. And what Kennedy outlined and the vision that he put forth is something that has been alive through the world and the the commitment uh, never waver again after this destruction and this apparatus who put military uh, concerns over the, the lives of beings. And he has taken that on and that has been what given many young people and those uh, generations themselves about the potential we have to create a better future for ourselves. And you see this now with the continued rapid pace of developments of the adoption, adopting of the very ideas that Lyndon LaRouche set into motion with his, his call for a just new world economic order. And this is being these policies are being adopted throughout the world right now the china belt and road initiative the collaboration and development of great projects that's going on throughout africa throughout the middle east throughout europe i mean this is what 
right now is absolutely essential for the United States to understand that without a commitment to ending the destructive bailout policies, the Wall Street looting, the speculative bubble, that we are missing a great opportunity to participate in a beautiful new paradigm throughout the world. And this is not what most politicians, um, what they call themselves, are, uh, are talking about right now. I mean, what we really need are people who are going to provide a leadership of statesmanship and who can work together with the American people to come up with the solutions that are going to be in the interest of every single person to advance the productivity and increase the creativity of every single person in the society. That's what every single Congress member should be committed to. They shouldn't be committed to pushing through a fraudulent uh, tax reform that is going to represent nothing toward addressing the economic and physical, economic, and scientific needs of our country right now. So this is what we have to put an end to is the insanity. We have to get people who can think, who can actually put forth a a real platform that is going to be a driver for the advancement of the society. And if you really want to think about how to do that, I mean, I think it's important to go back to understanding what President Kennedy did in his mobilization of a national recovery program for the economy and his commitment, as many people may think about, you know, Kennedy's vision and, and restoring a real commitment to an optimism for the country was around the perspective that he laid out of sending a man to the moon and returning him safely to earth before the decade is out. But how did that, how was that goal met? Um, first of all, not met without a real challenge coming and a, a, in, a many, in many respects, a backlash from the very people who today would oppose such a national mission and who continue, who opposed it then and who will continue to oppose it today. You know, the same people who would tell the president today of the United States that if see a infrastructure program implemented in place, uh, has now been reported that uh, many of the Republicans are telling the president that the only way that this would happen if he cuts Medicare and Medicaid. That's the only way we're going to be able to afford, uh, that's the only way we're going to be able to afford to have a infrastructure recovery program. I mean, how murderous or insane does that sound? We don't need to push an austerity program to get these policies accomplished. We don't need to uh, push a program of, you know, budget cuts but think about the reality of what it would look like if we had people that would say, that leadership that would say, no, we're going to take away the trillions of dollars in bailout money uh, from the Wall Street speculators. And we're going to put that into our national infrastructure, into our, uh, put that into our space program. Because I think the, the key right now is the understanding that, as, as Kennedy laid out, the basis for his science program, excuse me, the basis for his, his program for a launching of a moon mission to return to the moon was directly centered around a broader program of scientific and technological advancements. Uh, Kennedy was committed to having a, a tax credit program that actually gave necessary credit to different firms. Uh, it was going to advance the productivity of our society. These companies that wanted to invest in our, our national interest and in our 
productivity of our of our economy to put businesses forward that was going to uh, be essential in the development of a science driver program around our Apollo program. And this is what Linda LaRouche made clear absolutely critical in any policy that came out after that um, started to put into place a commitment to a revival of a national space mission around a, a return to a the moon taking sending human beings back to the moon and mars but if anybody carried out the true vision of continuing and moving to continue what president kennedy had put into place as an economic driver that every facet of your us economy every facet of your education of your um, technological advancement in your society was driven by this national commitment and this national mission. The national mission didn't come as a result of some Congress members saying, well, I'll let you know if we can do that once I check to find out what the budget is and if we can afford it. But we have to take care of our buddies on Wall Street first and then we'll tell you whether or not you can give Social Security and Medicare and whether or not you can have a space program. That doesn't work like that. So I think that what we have to define right now is very clear that we have a very important responsibility for those Americans who recognize and those patriots who recognize that this there's a unique opportunity before us and that the only way that we're going to secure victory in this country against the enemies and the powers that be, those who would reject such an optimistic vision for our country, is that we demand an end to their system and their existence right now by saying we're not going to condone this as a nation anymore. We're going to actually commit ourselves to a national mission, to a vision of optimism for the country, to saying as the Chinese and committing to doing and accomplishing the goal of ending poverty once and for all. And the conception, the, the way that that's going to be accomplished again is through recognizing that we have to commit to a real science driver crash program for the country, that we we have to restore our commitment to uh, increasing the number of, of scientists, of engineers, of educating our young people at the highest level. So I think that we are in a very unique position to respond to this demand of leadership. I uh, take on that challenge willingly, and I'm looking for people to join me and take on that challenge as uh, I as I do so, um, and to actually to make sure that we can move the country in the needed direction in the next 50 days now get the president to immediately adopt these policies of an economic recovery program that's been so defined by Lyndon LaRouche and his four economic laws, that now we can do that at the very time when the whole Mueller gate operation and this crowd of scandals um, who would do everything in their power you know, to see the nation destroyed. And this is what this is about. It's not about just, oh, we want to get, uh, that they want to get the President Trump out of there. But their intention is to create total chaos and destroy the nation. But as we can talk about more in the course of discussion tonight, that is backfiring. That crowd uh, in this coup plot is really being exposed as just that, and it can be 
eliminated and brought down now, and we can and must ourselves to uh, this beautiful perspective of ensuring our a, a, a national mission for the country again. So I want to leave it at that and just see what kind of thoughts are provoked there. Q&A session started. Very much, Keisha. Um, you can hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, very good. I just want to make sure my audio was okay. So I've opened up the, the question and answer queue. For people who are new, who are on the phone, press star six. Enter the queue. Again, press star six if you have a question or comment. But what I want to do is while people are doing that, I want to make sure that we give an update as to where we are this evening uh, with respect to the campaign around uh, the coup. Uh, against the presidency. Um, uh, so there are several things to say, but we're going to tonight do, uh, uh, we're going to refer to some of the reports in the press. There's a guy by the name of Mark Penn. He was a poster for Clinton when Clinton was president. And he wrote an article which was called Mueller FBI Safe Crisis in Public Confidence. And here's what he reports. And remember, this is a Clinton, former Clinton pollster. He says that 53% of the American people think the FBI has been resisting providing information to the Congress. 54% of Americans believe that Mueller has conflicts of interest that prohibit from conducting a fair investigation. Uh, last month, 51% was saying that the funding of the Fusion GPS dossier, in other words, the British intelligence dossier from Christopher Steele, that this should be investigated. And 58% said that if it were proven that Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party funded that dossier, which has now been proven, it could not be used by law enforcement. Now, anybody who knows remembers three months ago when this was all going on, you probably remember everybody being afraid and saying, you know, Trump definitely goes. He's probably guilty. We got to cut, you know, people got to cut their losses. No, something different is now happening. Um, and then this, this guy, Mark Penn, says the overwhelming, the overall public assessment is that the Mueller invest, investigation is blown. The FBI is stonewalled. Even back in the days of the Monica Lewinsky operation. The special counsel, uh, this being uh, Starr at that time, Kenneth Starr, the special counsel was not seen as having a conflict of interest. A counter theory has now emerged in which the dossier is peddled to the FBI systematically, including the hiring of the OJ official, uh, and despite its obvious bias and false content, used to start the Russian investigation by agents tinged with animus. Goes on, says many other things. Now let's go to the next. This is the Wall Street Journal. This is an editorial in the Wall Street Journal, which referenced this. Again, press star six to get in the queue if you have a question or comment. So at the conclusion of their editorial, they said the man most disturbed by all of this is Robert Mueller, who wants his evidence and conclusions to be credible with the public. Evidence is building instead that some officials at the FBI who have worked for him may have interfered in an American presidential election. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is heavy. They go on to say, Congress needs to insist its rights as a co-equal branch of government to discover the truth. Now, <clears throat> with respect to the particular things that occurred, which some of you it was a particular uh, thing that, that, that was discovered, which is that the wife of the number four official at the De Department of Justice, her name was Nellie Orr, worked for Simpson uh, at uh, uh, Fusion GPS. In other words, uh, she was the wife of the number four person who is part of the department that will investigate uh, Trump, but she was working for the people that were putting the, the dossier together. Now, why is this very important? Well, let's look at this. Number four means you have the attorney general, deputy attorney general, assistant deputy attorney general, and then the associate attorney general. That's Bruce Orr. This guy had met with Christopher Steele before the election. 
probably August of 2016. Okay? And then he and then he then met with Simpson, who had fusion after the election. It's possible. We don't know this. It's possible that Orr could have been involved in paying Steele money. The FBI may have paid Steele money or off to pay him money in the meeting in October before the election. That is not known, but that is possible. Uh, and, and what we're now looking at, of course, the thing that people have been talking about for the last 24 hours are these text me- uh, emails, rather, uh, or text messages, I guess, between this character, Peter Strzok. Peter Strzok was uh, the number two counterintelligence person for the FBI. Uh, and uh, he was involved in the investigation of Hillary Clinton on the emails. This was writing his girlfriend, Lisa Page. Uh, there are like 90 me- uh, uh, me- uh, pages of the message expressing that he did not want to see Donald Trump be president. Um, uh, he had many things to say. And the thing that became, that has now become most highlighted is the insurance policy. And what he says in, an, in a text message was, I want to believe the path that you threw out for consideration in Andy's office, that there's no way Trump gets elected, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. And he goes on to say, it's like an insurance policy in the unlikely event you die before you're 40. Now, the Andy he's referring to is Andrew McCabe, who, as you may remember, became the head of the FBI at the point that uh, the, 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 the uh, Mueller investigation began. And then there was a period where, uh, where Comey was out and then McCabe came in. The reason for going through these details for you is listen to this. All of these people, or many of these people, were working together six years before. Andy McCabe uh, coordinated a group which was called the Eurasian Organized Crime Task Force. And in that group were Christopher Steele, Simpson, and, uh, and the, the two oars. So this is way before. This is, this, is, this is something being coordinated six years before any of this even starts. In other words, what you have is something so incestuous, so corrupt. The wheels have begun to come off this investigation, and we, ladies and gentlemen, did this. So I just wanted to take that time because some people have asked to have some clarity about this or know what it's about, um, and, and that's what it's about. So just so that is known, of course, our dossier has now been, uh, our, our dossier, our pamphlet, and uh, and we want and we need people distributing that. We successfully raised the money to do that. Uh, we are still raising the money uh, uh, for the second. Although I believe that's now at the printer, it will be printed tomorrow. I believe and may be available by uh, by next week. So those are the things I wanted just to say uh, before we go to Q and A. Again, press star six to get in the queue, and I'm going to go to the first question. Okay, are you able to hear me? Sam, this is Jim from Michigan. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi. Okay. How are you doing, Keisha? Good, good. <laughs> the last time I talked to you was when you were last on the phone call, and I told you then that you ought to, again, you giggled and said, we'll see. Well, I'm glad that you're doing it. So, um Anyhow, uh, there's a town hall meeting tomorrow with Deborah Dingle, John Kildee, and Sandra Levin. I received an invitation to go there, but uh, with my condition, I won't be able to. So I passed it along to Kinda, and she told me that they'll have a team up there, which uh, is going to, I think, work out pretty good. And I, I think there's going to be quite a crowd. Uh, at any rate, uh, I'd like to know. Uh, you, you, you just filed. So uh, when are you going to actually start your campaigning? Right now. Okay. So uh, and for uh, collecting donations and all? That will be, be soon. You'll hear soon about that. Yes. Okay. Well, that's what I would like to know so I can do like I did last time. And I would implore everybody call to donate to your campaign. And... Uh, can Dennis or us know if anybody else 
organization is intending to file? Well, I think what's going on right now, there are discussions, but the basic conception we have is that Keish is the flagship. We'll see who rallies to it. Uh, then there'll be discussions about that. Uh, because what that will mean, just so everybody's clear, is that you know we're talking about around the country, people who think that they are or may be qualified to uh, take on the fight that's really there. So we're not going to make any announcements ourselves at the moment. Um, this is this, and this call is in fact intended to kind of get a uh, a, a kind of a measure of of how uh, people are thinking about okay. the uh, the actual matters that Keisha just put up, put forward. So. We're going to be um, a bit, and I won't call it coy, we're just going to be uh, cautious about any other announcements at this moment. But the main point is that it starts a discussion process. I think that's starting tonight. Right. And, and I think I'll just add that what we're looking for is people who would put themselves forward uh, as leaders. And uh, we're, we're also not just looking for, as many of you know, we've had before that um, were in terms of a national where many of the policy committee uh, young members were candidates and uh, we have a number of qualified people and people who um, represent different uh, interest of push putting forth this economic policy putting forth these solutions but represent various different groupings throughout the or uh, have connections with the United States um, within the ind independent Bernie Sanders, Republican Party, uh, Democratic Party. It doesn't matter what, but your ability to go out and actually lead and put forth these solutions and to bring together a team within the institution of the government, within the U.S. Congress, that's going fight for these solutions. I mean, I think that's that's the critical step that we need right now. And the key is to start doing it right now, to start, you know, who's actually going out there and mobilizing these different layers and these different networks, not saying that you're going to put your name out there on the ballot and then think about, as I said, implementing these policies some after election, but to move on them immediately now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, so I have one question that came in to me on a text message. This is from Scott. He's down in Alabama. He can't, uh, he has some problems sometimes. Uh, okay. But Scott, Scott is asking, of course, he, he's, he says, he says uh, we just had an election here in Alabama, as you know, and things were pretty, uh, were pretty lively. He says, but it was an upset so far as people were concerned. And he says, how do you think your chances are of upsetting uh, the status quo here? <laughs> Good question. Well, the, I think that the chances are very strong because it the campaign that we just saw in in Alabama, I think the, the reality we have to look at um, this this was not about anything that had to do with a national mission, and so and it wasn't a great victory for the Democrats or some great loss for the Republicans. And there was a whole different objection into that victory for the Democrat in in Alabama. But I think what really what what really defines something unique about my campaign. And why I'm in a position to really lead and, and win a victory in this campaign and lead the nation to victory with a, a slate of candidates who may emerge as a result of what I've laid out here and what my intention in the campaign is, is because of my unwavering um, commitment to tell the truth and to actually. Uh, fight in defense of these needed economic solutions. As said, no one's talking about a national mission. And this is what was a very strong point of 
point of success and victory during my campaigns before, no matter if they tried to put up a self-funded multimillionaire uh, against me or to uh, say put forth resolutions in the Democratic Party, he is not a Democrat, and to try to dismiss me from uh, actually having access to any kind of voter records or uh, anything that would help to help my campaign. I mean, all of this was a big failure on their effort. And I think that right now, what more people are going to respond to is, uh, I'm already getting a very uh, positive response to one, the idea of running an independent campaign, because more, pe- more and more people are recognizing that the party politics is just completely a banal waste. Uh, as pre- as the um, as President Washington said, politics is our nation's existence. And you can now, you can see this, you know, the members of the Republican Party are willing to do to destroy efforts of the president right now. Be very much moving in the direction. We had the right up and the right up in place. So, um, again, as I stated before, the commitment has to be bringing the United States immediately. The who will act now to bring the United States immediately into this emerging new paradigm, into the Belt and Road Initiative, and 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 bring and make a commitment to demand that these policies around the urgent solutions put forth by LaRouche around the four economic laws be put in place. And if we can get a a number of people who are running for political office, who are committed to to seeing this, this through, these policies actually enacted, then we can turn this country around. So uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, especially here, I'm in a district where uh, running against Al Green, um, which was really much created as a safe zone for Al Green, um, uh, African American Congress member. The district um, has, you know, it's a strong, strong African American presence, but it also, you know, has a very large population of international population representing key components of those nations that are very active in the Belt and Road, in the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, and who have joined this uh, representation of of almost uh, 5 billion people across the the world right now who have joined with this, this Belt and Road perspective of China. So, I think that we have a unique opportunity. I've seen this with throughout the district. And the fact of the matter is, is that what you're seeing right now is a real hunger and eagerness for someone to actually provide, that, someone to actually fight for a real economic platform and for a real infrastructure program that's going to uh, rebuild our commitment to to putting people back to work, you know, taking people off the streets. The level of unemployment right now is rampant. The level of drug abuse, of um, of prostitution, of uh, various uh, things that you know are not just present in my district, but uh, have been dominant throughout the the, the country. But we can see as a result of what just happened in in West Virginia with the current deals of economic trade deals that were just made of uh, representing close to $83.7 billion. Uh, the, many people may have heard that the mayor of Houston just sent a, just not sent, pardon me, just went with a delegation led a delegation to China himself uh, with over 80 business leaders uh, to discuss economic deals for the 
Houston area. What do we represent here? My district is the is the um, medical center, the international medical center, which has international uh, implications, uh, represented by the spinoffs and the development of our of our space program, and has been the key product of the Kennedy economic vision. So again, I, I mean, I just wanted to kind of put that out there as perspective, but um, we think that this district has an opportunity to truly lead and transform the nation by what is qualified to represent that um, right now, uh, as the mayor just came back from China, I mean, this is this has been what we've been promoting um, and have stood out for calling for a U.S.-China collaboration and commitment. And you're now seeing this has to be a national interest. It can't just be piecemeal, different states taking up um, cooperation with China. But we have to move it rapidly forward. So there, there is a... I think that we're in a situation right now, if we put that out front, then that's going to be the key to victory, uh, nothing else. Okay, good. Let me go to the next person here. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. I can hear you fine. Uh, Lynn Steed in uh, New York, New Jersey. Can you hear me? No, it yes. is. <laughs> Hi, Keisha. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> I just wanted to give a quick report, which is a pretty uh, uh, fine. Uh, it was in the New York Times, and then we began verifying this and actually uh, working on getting more intelligence on it over the next uh, over the last couple of days. They reported that on the competency tests for English and math that were given to students in the New York City area uh, between grades three and eight, that only 40% of the kids overall passed tests. But the gist of the article was actually to report on the homeless children of which one in every 10 school children uh, in New York City have been homeless in the last year. Those kids uh, were half of that. So there were only 20% of those children that were reading uh, on a, a that were reading at the actual grade level. Everybody else was failing. The article further went on to say, but the homeless kids actually did better than the kids with homes in places in uh, former industrial centers in upstate New York, like Rochester and Buffalo and Syracuse, uh, which were big uh, auto and steel places uh, previously, because in those places, the uh, the non the kids with homes only scored eight percent, but yet once again the homeless kids scored four percent. So I, I think we have a, a situation which is it is really horrifying in terms of a cultural uh, dark age. And I'm mentioning this because I think it would be important to also check this out in terms of what exists in major other major cities across the country. Uh, you know, in Texas, but Michigan, former industrial centers, but really everywhere, because clearly this is a of what we've been discussing, the total lack of mission uh, in the country. And it is also something that can only be remedied really with Lynn's uh, four laws, uh, starting with Glass-Steagall and most emphatically the whole space program, uh, advanced technology, uh, mission. Uh, so I think the, the it, it, Keisha, your campaign in terms of being a flagship uh, for this, and also perhaps one of the, the uh, things that the campaign can do is um, uh, take up and expose what is a 
absolute, uh, you know, educational collapse. I mean, we're creating a generation clearly of total illiterates. Uh, uh, if you can, if 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 you have that kind of thing, that has to be highlighted, has to be uh, reversed. So um, maybe you want to just comment, whatever you have as a comment on that. Good. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that that is critical to the understanding of how you are going to accomplish, how we're as a we as a nation will accomplish the goal of setting forth a vision and a national mission. And this is, if you, you think about it, I mean, this is what was really unique about President John F. Kennedy's understanding, because it is, I mean, we look 45 years now since we have set presence on the moon as a nation, even with all of the scientific and technological breakthroughs, which could not have been done without a real education driver. and that that we have taken that much time to continue to break down our education system. And, I mean, it's been what we've seen in the past 45 years is not just the shutting down of our commitment to return to the moon or a space mission, but our overall commitment to the cultural progress and the education uh, and the human development of the people of our, our nation. And I, I think it's fitting to actually uh, quote this message of President John F. Kennedy, uh, which takes up just what you just discussed right now in terms of the cultural breakdown and degeneracy and the dumbing down of the, of the ch children of our nation who are to be educated as the leaders of our nation, but they're not being educated as leaders. They're being educated to be non-productive, and so we have to change that. But I think what Kennedy uh, put forth as the human requirements for a true um, uh, national mission well, is absolutely profound, and it really is the continuation or is, is what is now being continued by the commitment of LaRouche in and what we've been fighting for in this organization for a real renaissance in thinking. So uh, Kennedy says he delivered a message to Congress on education, and this was February 20th, 1961. He said, our progress as a nation can be no swifter than our progress in education. Our requirements for world leadership, our hopes for economic growth, and the demands of citizenship itself in any era such as this all require the maximum development of every American's capacity. He goes on to say, the human mind is our fundamental resource. A balanced federal program must go well beyond investment in plant and equipment. It must include equally determined measures to invest in human beings, both in education and training and in their more advanced preparation for professional work. He says too many classrooms are overcrowded, too many teachers are underpaid, too many talented individuals cannot afford the benefits of higher education, too many academic institutions cannot offer the cost of or find room for the growing numbers of students seeking admission. So that, but I think that the the perspective that he laid out there that we're talking about the most funda fundamental resource, the human mind and the the actual cultivating of the human mind. And this is what is absolutely any political leader to actually say, we're going to have a strong commitment to our education system, to transforming our education system, um, and to making sure that, that the transformation of our education system is essential and central to a national mission and a, 
and an economic science driver program. So I, I'm glad you brought that up because, I mean, it, it is the case that a lot of people right now are are suffering. A lot of our children are being denied as to a beautiful culture of discovery. And when Mr. LaRouche set out his policy back in 1986, calling for the science and technology to colonize Mars and his commitment to a moon Mars a science driver, space, space driver program, you know, this was the essential basis of what, what had to be the first prior, one of the first priorities is uh, the commitment to increasing human discovery and educating the minds of your young people. So that's, I mean, it's absolutely imperative. And I think we have some very solid examples of why we have no excuse for allowing for our young people to suffer in such a way and to be denied access to such a, quali a, a real quality of education and a real renaissance in thinking and a creative process. And this is what you know, Mr. LaRouche and our organization has very profoundly committed to achieving and what my campaign is going to uh, fight to continue to make sure that we can really bring about as a national priority. Okay. Okay, good. So let's see. Let's go to the next. All right, are you able to hear me? Yes. Um, hi, Keisha. This is Alvin here in New York. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, hi. Uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, have you talk with us about, uh, because I really think that what you're, what's been announced here over the recent period, uh, the more I think about it, uh, you're reemerging now as a viable candidate, uh, not just merely a candidate. In uh, the state of Texas as a representative has significance. Um, when you think about what you've mentioned already, uh, the moves of China now to bring the One Belt, One Road, and it's being welcomed uh, by a major city in the United States with all types of uh, uh, needs and potential as a port and so on, uh, with what's happened in West Virginia. When you look at victories of the Russians in avoiding World War III by driving, in essence, virtually all of the terrorists out of Syria. Um, so that these operations have uh, sent the establishment uh, and the enemy such a freak out. Uh, I have one of my contacts that has been affected by the series of articles coming out uh, against China that are ridiculous, but saying, you know, warning us, right, about this China interference, another using that word interference again, and taking over, buying real estate and things like that. So your voice, your national voice uh, out of that state, I think, takes on a very real significant uh, role for us to, to follow and point others to. Um, including the upcoming new pamphlet we'll have is also as another weapon on the four laws. So uh, I don't think, I'm not sure if people really understand the moment that we're at and what a pivotal role you're going to play in leading us to lead the nation out of that. So I wanted to say that and I'd like for you to, uh, you know, elaborate a little bit more on these things. Well, I key is going to be understanding the the shift that's emerging throughout the world right now that many people uh think about how to respond to the the needs of the moment right the needs of the nation and how to respond to the the solutions that are required for the country by just thinking about local locally local how you're going to meet local needs and local demands but unless you're
thinking from the top down, thinking about that the needs of the nation is going to be met through international cooperation, through you know the emphasis and the importance right now on anyone who is going to be a viable candidate and leader for the country has to actually be willing to fight to bring the United States into this this new paradigm. And I mean, it's a setback for, for our nation, uh, dismissal of collaboration, particularly not in all this, but uh, most emphatically uh, national program with NASA and China uh, because of the, some Congress members prohibiting the cooperation around the space program. And I mean, there's been many ways that this has been created by, you know, work China through the State Department or various other things, but that's not going to work because we have the only way that you're going to actually be able to have integrated international mission uh, of cooperation and a shared community of principle of of the meeting the common aim of mankind is the space program is going to be essential to that. And so I think that a lot of people, you know, even today, you now have people who are trying to come out and say on the 45th anniversary of our uh, last human mission to oh we never went to the moon that's just a <laughs> yeah. that's just a fraud and there's so many crazy videos that are coming out today denying mm. that i mean it, that it's not new that's what they intended to do there was reports put out uh, saying that the space program was too optimistic it was too visionary you had to stop it at all costs because you were going to put false um, hopes in people's minds. It wasn't false hopes. It completely transformed our economy. And, that, and it, it transformed the optimism and the thinking process of the society. And I mean, I think it not, it's going to be critical that we have to recognize that only through an international cooperation are we going to really accomplish this goal. So I mean, I think I wanted to say, just to put in there, because uh, I wasn't able to mention it earlier, that uh, for people who've been following the rapid pace of development of what China's been doing with their national space program, um, this, that what we're talking about right now is not just a uh, U.S.-led versus China versus Russia versus other nations, but there's going to have to be an international cooperation. And I mean, just think about it. Actually, uh, today represents the anniversary of the first uh, spacecraft, the soft land, uh, China's first space spacecraft, uh, the Chang'e 3, uh, to soft land on the moon. Uh, and it was, it's been the first soft spacecraft, uh, December 14th, 2013, to soft land on the moon since the Soviet Union launched the, uh, its spacecraft in 1976. So the United States sent a human being, uh, the Apollo, sent human beings, the Apollo 17 astronauts, to the moon in 1972. And then in 19 76, we had the Russian, the Soviet Union send a spacecraft unmanned to the moon. In 2013, uh, the Chinese launches first spacecraft to the moon. I mean, we have a long way to go. And in terms of reversing the decade long of uh, Continued backwardness or anti progress and development, which is now becoming a, a priority and a commitment by nations such as China, Russia, and those nations which are joining with the Belt and Road Commitment. So, this is not just something that can, is a nice idea, or you know, if you 
like China or like Russia or something like that, maybe you, you would go for it. But this is a mirror to the development of mankind throughout the planet. Really so. Okay, good. We'll go to the next question. All right, you would hear me. Hello, this is Lauren Penny from Michigan. Keisha? Hi. Hey, what's up, Hart? Now, uh, with these, I mean, that, you know, uh, system is in place to, you know, fund all these large infrastructure projects like uh, water management systems, the new flood water management systems, uh, nuclear power plant development, and space exploration along the uh, science driver education programs. Uh, lots of contracts and lots of contractors, individuals, large masses of people in the United States that would be involved in having plans and do certain types of business and uh, governmental activities with their, uh, you know, government agencies like Department of Commerce. And, you know, there's just a lot of planning and contracting involved in, you know, creating all these jobs and things like that. And I'm here in Michigan, and, you know, I'm a single dad, I uh, work, you know, and I do what I can to uh, get to the meetings. And there's a meeting coming up this weekend, and uh, I'm not sure exactly. I got the address, though. It's on Saturday I'll be going to. And I was wondering if maybe you could... Uh, Maybe talk to some of the people, or get to like Bill Roberts, or some of the people that will be at the meeting this weekend to work on uh, an assembly where we can develop and manage the public and private policies to plan, actually, like get going so that we can implement these four laws and start these large infrastructure projects immediately. It's kind of a big yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I mean, it it can be done. The the key thing is to recognize that the solutions are outlined very clearly. The the same mm -hmm. policy that LaRouche has outlined in his um for economic laws for legal banking reorganization. I mean, now is the people can't just actually uh pay, pay, play lip service. Uh, there's much support for Glass-Steagall out there, but the willingness to take on the powers that be, to take on the enemy apparatus of Wall Street, um, and to say Wall Street has to be, uh, and what it represents it has no real, um, has has nothing, yeah, nothing productive for the country, exactly. Um, and so that it, it has to be eliminated. But that once you have a commitment to saying we're going to put forth these laws now and adopt them as immediate law for the nation, uh, I think that's that's the thing that we have to get these Congress members and these representatives, uh, anyone who's running for political office now, that has to be the challenge to them everywhere. Uh, they can't just have a safe zone to say, okay, well, you've been in there, so... Uh, I have an obligation to to you to to let you stay in there because you have some kind of tenure or something like that. But but I think the key thing you know you just mentioned and uh, someone else mentioned earlier, these Congress members are having these town hall meetings. Uh, this is the time are actually having these discussions because they're running for office and they think that. The constituents are just going to go out there and, and vote for them. But you have to say, what have you done? What are you going to do? Why should we continue to keep you in office? Uh, the education is the key right now that people have to become immersed in understanding backwards and forwards what these economic policies mean, what they represent, how they are to be implemented. Um, you look at the history behind what Mr. LaRouche is instituting and, and putting forth as a 
policy for a national credit program. You know, it's very similar to what President John F. Kennedy was putting forth in his Apollo program and his economic recovery program as a tax credit incentive program for federal uh, system, which is nothing to do with what the Republicans are talking about right now. Um, what it had to do with is investment in the rising productivity, improvements in work and skilled labor and advancements in the technology um, of our of our economy and our society. It had to do with ensuring that every single person was going to be able to be productive. So uh, that's, I know that might not have, gotten directly to your question, but I mean, I think the key oh, thing right okay. now is how you're, how you're thinking about what your responsibility is and everybody on this call and how quickly you can educate people to, t you know, to demand that these solutions be taken up. Well, I raised my daughter and she has some excellent teachers and she's learning so well and developing so great. And I see a lot of roadblocks. Uh, kind of like the roadblocks that Trump talks about that the teachers have, you know, and where, you know, there's funding and then there's these policies placed on them by, you know, federal and state regulations and things like that. But there's, I mean, the, 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 the people, they're, they're great. They, mm -hmm. they have, we have great teachers here. So, I mean, it's just a matter of organizing everyone and, Getting the contract right and the policies. Yeah, Getting but that's, assembling. That's the you may have great, you know, great teachers there, and there's, you know, some t people who are passionate and they're great teachers, but they're not giving the 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 means and the culture and the system educationally o overall is not geared toward giving them the tools they need to actually yeah, be roadblock. able to be effective. Yeah, that's it. And the, ro <laughs> yeah. the roadblock block is only going to be um, be taken away by a restored national mission. And the only person that can actually put forth a national mission is the president of the United States. That's the, yeah. that's the point, is that none of this is going to happen by just trying to go around and get the bills passed through Congress and get, you know, Congress members to adopt these uh, policies. But as Kennedy did with the Apollo program, as we launched the National Recovery Program, it was a vision set forth by the President of the United States that um, was followed through. Very and Well, you do know, you do know that um, I've sent quite a few emails recently to the president and that uh i've been considering actually composing a very fine uh email to send to him about you know his next uh you know press conference or whatever that's going to be coming up I yeah let me just the say state I'm, of the union okay go yes, ahead state of the union. That's just, sorry that that's a very that's an excellent idea and that's just i just want to interject here because that's going to be in less than 50 days everybody and we definitely want people activated in that way we've also our two pamphlets particularly the america uh, america's role in the silk road to which will be coming out um we have about five or six other callers though we only got about 12 minutes thanks I'm keisha see ya thank you Bye. thank you but to hear me hello jim you speak up a little bit yeah, this this our uh, Dennis. I mean, uh, this is Ron Lazoric from South Dakota. Can you hear me? Yes. Keith, hi. Can you make him out? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Go ahead, I, Ron. I'd like to make a statement thanking uh, you know for taking the leadership and 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 running for uh, uh, you know a national office and 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 giving the nation a mission again. Um, I just want to give a, a quick report here on, I've done a little research in the last few days uh, on a USDA report that come out November 7th, uh, and I think the University of New Hampshire, um, uh, one of the uh, schools up there was in on, the, on a part of the policy uh, discussion. But anyway, they were talking about um, the dramatic downturn in rural America's 
economic and social outlook over the past decade, and neither sees, you know, any turn or quick turnaround. Uh, the USD report uh, uh, showed that uh, for the first time in the nation's history, rural America lost population. In D, or let's see, uh, uh, between uh, 20, 2016, a historical high of 1,351 rural counties lost population, while only 487 rural counties, uh, you know, had positive. That was, uh, you know, nothing big. And uh, part, of, part of that, um, where they had rural growth was due, due to the, la you know, the oil boom in the last uh, 10 years, which has now faded away. Um, and then another thing that was brought out in a, another study that we're looking at was the uh, unanta uh, unanticipated trend contributing to the lower rural population is the increased mortality of working age adults. And it's and it's uh, they're they're blaming it basically on uh, the raising rates of uh, prescription medication abuse, uh, especially and related a rise in heroin overdose deaths. And uh, between 1999 and 2001 and uh, 2013 to 15 period, mortality increased more than 20 percent for. 25 to 29 year olds and the 20 to 24 year old at range and the 30 to 54 year uh, 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 range wasn't quite as high, but that that's drastic. And uh, I, I, I just uh, think, you know, that if we could uh, uh, get something going with, with the water development or the WAPA project down through the central part of the United States here, the, the cent central part of the continent, Tying, uh, you know, uh, Beijing to Houston, Texas, via the Bering Sea Tunnel, and then bringing water, uh, you know, with a WAPA project down through the central part of this country and into the Texas area. I mean, uh, this could be the salvation of, of uh, you know, the midsection of the country, certainly. At, uh, plus, the, uh, you know, the increase in, in uh, the economy would definitely. Uh, benefit the rest of the nation and, and also the rest of mankind. Um, there, there's quite a bit more here that I'd like to go over, but I don't want to take up any more time. But I just I just think that we really got to work on on getting this project going and moving uh, with Lynn's uh, four laws. And uh, I mean, we're not going to have a, a another opportunity like this in in a long time. We may never have the opportunity again. So if we blow it this time, you know, like we did in 1989 when the wall come down and we failed to move out of Europe, uh, building rails to the Pacific Ocean, uh, uh, I don't know. But I, I, it just it, it's pretty bad for the nation and mankind to me if we don't get our nation up and going. Absolutely, I agree. We'll get you writing on the campaign policy page. <laughs> That's exactly what we need. Okay. Right. And uh, actually, Ron, I want to uh, talk with you at the end of the call after it's all over because I want I couldn't write uh, down what you were saying. It's an important report. Put that together, what we were getting from Manhattan on the homelessness among students. Um, obviously, we, we're getting uh, some reports on the economy, the real state of the real economy, which is good. Okay. Well, we'll go to the poverty rate. The, the poverty rate in the rural areas is lower than the poverty rate in the cities, and the cities are terrible. Yes. Mm. Mm. And we have one of the highest uh, poverty uh, rates in this district that I'm for, um, the in the city of Houston. And, I mean, it's it's very important what you just laid out, and I think that's what we have to make a commitment to exposing and putting it putting an end to. This is why this this campaign and these camp, uh, uh, campaign this national perspective is so important right now. You go, girl. You go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> is that, we have a, okay. We're at our next call. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is Deborah Jamber in Houston, Texas, in the 9th Congressional District of Al Green. Hi, my friend. All so, right. <laughs> so excited about your campaign. Um, I, 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 I'm going to run myself, but I'm a little busy. <laughs> uh, so I, I got a question about Rico. Um, nobody, it's not in the news. I mean, if you try to do a Google search, all you're finding out is there's trash building up and it's a mess and there's no electricity. And, and I'm, I'm like, what is going on? Why is nobody responding to this? Uh, what is going on? I, I'd like to know what is going on and what the solution is going to be for that mess over there. Well, I mean, I think the, the same thing that's, has been going on in terms of from the set of these hurricanes and that, you know, what we've just been discussing throughout this entire uh, call that uh, because the policies needed uh, to be implemented around uh, the economic policies put forth by LaRouche around a fusion driver, a science driver, a commitment to um, a fusion platform, a commitment to actual uh, economic recovery for infrastructure development, uh, that that still hasn't been addressed. It hasn't been addressed with it, with Harvey. Uh, there's still a lot to be cleaned up in Texas and Houston area where you are uh, here with my, myself also. Uh, there's a lot of un left left unanswered touched responses to to actually addressing the the physical economic needs and so the same thing you know about about Puerto Rico that you have a state which is um, or territory however you want to say uh, of uh, of the United States that is again not the needs are not being addressed in terms of um, having the lives of uh, thousands, millions of people being threatened um, because we have to have immediate emergency action. As far as what some of the direct responses that are, are going on, I know there's various proposals for budgets to, um, for one thing, that uh, the the uh, energy secretary is very strongly promoting uh, mission for a return for development of a few, excuse me, for nuclear power. But I mean, all of these things, you have to actually have a federal cro credit program to immediately be able to go in and wage an emergency recovery program. Um, it's not just going to be just as whether it's in Florida or Texas or in Puerto Rico, you're not just going to actually have piecemeal of dumping a few billion dollars, million dollars for uh, fixing up existing infrastructure, but you have to have a total um, redevelop uh, development of new infrastructure, uh, new energy systems, new platforms for, for actually rebuilding our infrastructure and putting new infrastructure in place like uh, various flood control systems, uh, dam projects. So there's a lot that, that can be done and why it hasn't been done yet is really a reflection of the fact that people are too busy trying to run a coup on the President of the United States right now and as was already stated, as political intentions and it's coming out that this had nothing or has nothing to do with what it was stated to do, which was to investigate on some kind of collusion of Russian colluding or anything else. But it was it was politically motivated all along. And while we're dealing with that, as you're saying, people are suffering and that it's so not that key thing right now is this goes right back to uh, the President of the United States has as a very important obligation right now, we're going to institute a national mission, emergency 
state of emergency. There needs to be a state of emergency for um, for Puerto Rico. We need to make sure that these people are taken care of. Infrastructure is built immediately to save lives. That's just anywhere. That's obvious. Uh, let me say one thing about this also, Tisha, because it's of interest to people, I think. One of our colleagues was just down in Dutch Guiana, Suriname is what it's called now. Uh, it's in between uh, Guiana, the nation Guiana, which used to be called British Guiana, and French Guiana. And in the course of being there, there was a discussion about the question of the prospect of the new Silk Road. And this, these conferences are actually happening all over South America. There were over 3,000 other officials in the course of the last approximately two months who've been involved down in South America in different countries in discussions about the extension of the new Silk Road. Now, why this is relevant is to know that Panama just a couple of weeks ago, or excuse me, just a couple of months ago, recognized uh, uh, China. They had been uh, had their embassy with Taiwan instead of China. And they did that because they want to be incorporated into the new Silk Road. Uh, it's well known that besides Panama and the Panama Canal, that another canal has to be built, it will be built through Nicaragua, because the size of the ships that are now being constructed uh, uh, is such that they won't be able to fit through the Panama Canal. So we're talking here Nicaragua, Panama, and now here's the additional one, Haiti, the nation of Haiti has a, has a uh, relationship with China right now in which it's being rebuilt, or at least part of it is going to be rebuilt uh, by China. There's uh, like a $4.5 billion conception of a deal that's been done there. Uh, as, you may, as you know, that's uh, the, the west side, the island of Hispaniola, the other side is the Dominican Republic. And both of these territories, of course, have a lot to do with the United States. Now, if, if, you look at, if you look at that area, the Caribbean, in other words, and the northern part of South America, and you look at historic U.S. interests there, and you look at what the president has tried to do in his relations with China, if there were no coup that was going on right now, Puerto Rico could be addressed at the same time as you addressed Haiti, Panama, uh, and this issue of a second Panama Canal, several things at once. Number one, the Chinese would love to do that. Uh, they, they need to do that for various reasons of their own. Number two, the United States would profit mightily by doing that because it would actually solve long-term historical problems there. And number three, Houston, that whole area of the Gulf, immediately gets incorporated into this uh, because there are a series of both deep water ports uh, and, and advanced potential energy projects that could be conducted. Now, now we all know that, that somebody like Secretary of State Tillerson is going to be for that, or others are going to be for that. But as Keisha just said, the coup is the problem. This would already have, frankly, happened just like West Virginia happened, uh, you know, when, when Trump was there in November, uh, if, if not for this whole process. So I just wanted to add that so that that might be, you know, known to people. Uh, and and we, we might, maybe we can, uh, if, we, if we succeed in what we're doing, we may see something happen uh, positive there. Absolutely. And, I th and just to say, I think China China is absolutely ready to respond. And uh, that just reminds me that there was a uh, there is a gentleman here who wrote an article uh, discussing the the way to for an infrastructure recovery program in the United States is that you can't disregard the very important role of collaboration between the United States and, and China to be able to come in and invest in and to help to build in, in some of these areas, um, especially around Harvey recovery or the hurricane recovery program. So, um, I mean, if we can get $83.5 in terms of trade and investment uh, in West Virginia, then um, the key thing right now is immediately getting the United States to join with this Belt and Road perspective. And there is going to be immediate um, development in terms of cooperation, which is needed because we're not going to be able to do this on our own. The 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 urgent need of the building up of the skilled and labor force and the economy. I mean, if the if the, the Chinese came over and they helped to with the cooperation around the and it was an international 
effort around the um, development of Lincoln's Transcontinental Railway in a certain in a different way, and the, just the development of the United States we, it has always been around international cooperation, but it's at a completely different level right now. But just a matter of how quickly we can actually bring the United States into um, joint collaboration and partnership with China and think about it in a completely different way than what uh, we have taught to think about it before as a uh, competitive or, you know, one that one nation out to have a domination over the other. But we got to save now. And I think that, you know, the key is to br get the United States to join in this uh, economic, into this policy of cooperation. Keisha, we still have a few more questions. It's pretty late. I just wanted to know what do you want to do? I think there are a total of three more at the moment. Take a pool and choose one. Okay, fine. We'll just, <laughs> Sorry. We'll do it like that. Sorry about that, everybody. It's, I, I, it's for security reasons. Um, yeah, anyway, so I can't stay later. That's <laughs> great. great, exactly. So okay. I'm, I'm going to take one. I apologize. Uh, I'm just going to be the next one up. So here we go. All right. Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, I'll go to the next one. Okay. Are you able to hear me? Yes. This is Sarah from Indiana. I just want to congratulate you, Keisha, on your running. I just want to laser focus the major difference between your run for office compared to thousands of other running for office is your dedication to the founding constitution and its values, which are reflected in LaRouche's four laws. And when we return to our founding constitution and its values, it incorporates the national abundance, the national infrastructure, the, you know, so many national programs that interface with international law to other nations and China and Russia have traditionally been allies of Americans. So that I just wanted to laser focus the difference between your run office and thousands of others. Um, and I'm just going to quickly mention that there is budget leverage to be had in every city, county, state and federal agency in regards to the KEFR budget and the public because the public budgets are always short and those are actually fraud and there's actually billions or trillions of dollars that are being misdirected that every city, county, state should have forensic audit. So I've been sharing this information for over a year now, and I will forward to some national statistics and information on the Kefir account that everyone can bring up in city councils or county councils or state legislature to to demand the shortage be addressed and the funds put to use towards infrastructure and programs. So. And I, I mean, I think that the key is to have a clear uh, laser focus on that there's not going to be any type of budgetary matters, uh, localized budgets that are, are going to address these needs at all. Um, that you have to have a federal credit program. You have to actually put forth, as Alexander Hamilton does in his um, his policies outlined in his uh, reports on uh, public credit and national banking, uh, which are essential to what LaRouche laid out in his 
for economic loss, uh, which LaRouche ha and has made very clear that this has be to be a priority of study for any uh, any citizen of our nation, uh, a true constitutional, uh, constitutionalists or people who are committed to the ideas imb embedded in our constitution, uh, and just to patriots overall that you, know, you have to come to understand how a federal credit program actually works and uh, that it's, you know, you can't just have uh, a budget program of taking from one budget to the other to be able to accomplish the needs we we have. I mean, this is the thing that they were trying to do with the uh, space programs after, pres after President Kennedy was assassinated. Before President Trump just made his announcement for revival of the U.S. space program to a commitment to a return to the moon and then on to Mars, this was already discussed. It was discussed actually by and was a, uh, policies were put in place by President bo both Bush presidencies actually Bush Jr. and Bush Sr. Um, just three years uh, on the, I guess it was the the 20th anniversary of uh, the Apollo moon landing. Uh, and years after Lyndon LaRouche put forth this uh, science and technology needed to colonize Mars, his moon Mars program, and what he defined as a, uh, a presentation, his television presentation of a woman on Mars, um, there was a there was a policy announced by Bush Sr. of a return to the moon and then on to Mars. But people thought that you could only accomplish this through budget cuts or by taking from one piece of the pie to give to another. And it's just um, not going. And so that, that program failed. Um, it never got put through for many reasons. Um, but and just as the same thing under Bush Jr. Um, with the Constellation program, commitment to return to the moon. So again, the key is understanding that the uh, actual success of a, of a national mission being realized right now is only going to be done through this commitment to a, a federal credit national. Uh, mission orientation toward uh, restoring uh, and to putting forth the four laws that LaRouche has laid out. So um, you're not going to do, not going to do it on a local level uh, through yeah. local budgets. Now, out of okay, Sarah, we're going to have to get going because Keith has got know, to go. The national okay. uh, credit agency that FDR created, what has happened to it? Where is it now? Um, what do you mean? What has happened to it? That I mean, I think I think I just answered that question. Yeah, so. she really just did answer that. <laughs> that where it is, is it's in the presidency. FDR was the president. That's why he was able to do what he did. It wasn't the system; it was the person. And we do have a president in the White House right now who put forward several policies. But I think what keeps this whole point and what we've seen tonight is that this is the personage. You have to have people who are willing to define the policy concretely and stand up for it. And then the president exactly. of the United States can respond to that. Exactly. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> okay. So we got a lot of work to do to make sure that we can, in these next less than 50 days before President Trump is going to give his State of the Union, we need to make sure that the words that he spoke about a commitment to a a American system to returning our nation to uh, the moon and Mars and beyond, and to actually have a permanent presence in space, and a commitment to working with China and working with Russia. That things, despite any kind of do it, are his national priority, and that he says this is what we are going to define for our nation for the better betterment and for
country. So we, but he's going to need to back up, and we're going to have to educate a lot of people. And so I think that this campaign, my campaign, is going to play an essential role. I encourage other people to take up that uh, take up that leadership to to take up that responsibility as well. So I think I'll leave it at that. Exactly. Okay, I want to thank everybody, particularly but everybody for listening tonight. There's a lot of work we can do for next week. What we're going to be looking at is our Monday call we to expand because by that time we will have two pamphlets that will be out. You'll hear more about that later. And uh, for next Thursday, I hope to have Will Wirtz on. Uh, that will be important for all of you who will want to get a thorough, detailed update on uh, what we've done and what needs to be done next to make the coup, to, to if you will, eviscerate the coup operation. Um, so that's the kind of thing where we may want to get some of, you want to look at new people getting on, uh, people that may have uh, some idea what's going on, but they're un unclear about it. Uh, so think about it and think about building that call accordingly. All right, so very good people. And so we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Q&A session is over. Your conference recording has stopped. Goodbye.